Good morning, Martin, and thank you for that introduction. And I hope everyone is doing okay this morning, wherever you are. Now, there are two areas of my life um, where I tend to surprise people with my optimism. The first is in my feminism. Now, given the horrific events of recent weeks in particular, that might sound surprising. And believe me, I was one of the many sat on the floor weeping with rage and pain of it all. But I remain hopeful that we can change. Now, optimistic feminists really confuse people. So it means it's a powerful place to work for change from. And it kind of feels the same to me with the climate crisis at times. It is pretty grim. So being an optimist and having hope feels like an act of rebellion, really. And I am an optimist and I do have hope. So in sharing what I'm about to with all of you, I do so in the belief that not only must we do more, we actually can. It is possible. Now, optimism is important, but I'm acutely aware it's not a strategy and that we need to focus on implementation and figuring out the how-to of the activities which will help us to tackle the issues that we are considering at this event and tackle them at pace. And maybe what I'm about to share with you is probably best imagined as Lego, not the stuff laid out on the floor to endanger you as you walk through the room with bare feet. I'm not that cruel. Instead, laid out on the table to play with, to stack together, to rebuild, to collaborate with others, to reconsider, figure out what works for you. Now, there's no doubt that one of the biggest levers being pulled in the business and social enterprise world right now is ESG, Environmental, Social and Governance Frameworks. And as this is day two of this event, I'm guessing if you were keeping a tally score of how many times these letters have been uttered, it might be quite high. So the good news is I am talking about ESG as only part of what I'm going to explore this morning. And of course, ESG is not the only framework in town. Others are using sustainable development goals from the UN, others guided by donor economics or the work of the Wellbeing Alliance. There are toolkits, there are consultancy firms, there are training courses and professional development programs, including, I have to um, get the plug in here, ours at IOD Scotland in partnership with the Royal Scottish Geographic Society. And then, of course, there are many, many, many online guides. So maybe you have your favoured framework already, or maybe you are, like others, still trying to figure out where to start and what your route map might look like. But let's dial back a little. I've just passed my 100 days mark as the new National Director of the IOD in Scotland. So far, I've resisted the lure of writing a blog about it. That seems to be the rule, but I've decided not to do that. But if I did, then one of the things that I would no doubt talk about is what has stood out for me over this period is how alive and constant the conversation around achieving and going beyond net zero is amongst the IOD Scotland community. Now, the IOD is a membership organisation for directors, CEOs, chairs, non-executives, etc., from the business community and cross sectors. Our North Star is to support directors on their learning journey. So, yeah, we do lots of networking and policy work, as you would expect. But specifically, we offer an outstanding professional development programme on all aspects of leadership and governance. We want to support more people to become chartered directors. We are the Chartered Institute. But as part of that, we believe that great governance, board and director competence and ethical leadership are all vital components in the work to tackle the climate emergency. And we want to bring this into the discussions about the crisis much more visibly and actively. Now, in terms of what the IOD itself is doing in this space, we are supporting directors in the adoption and management of sustainability policies through our IOD Sustainability Hub and our member-led task force with a specific focus through the good governance lens. And we're committed to our own sustainability journey as an organisation, as are 
many others. We've been certifying our carbon footprint with Planet Mark since 2019, with a commitment to reducing our environmental impact each year to, to the journey to net zero. And we're a supporter of the UN-backed Race to Zero campaign. But at this point, I'd also want to flag our support for the Better Business Act campaign. Launched in April this year and led by Douglas Lamont, CEO of Innocent Drinks, it calls for an amendment to Section 172 of the Companies Act to make sure that every single company in the UK, whether big or small, aligns the interests of their shareholders with those of wider society and the environment. So if you haven't come across that Better Business Act campaign yet, I'd encourage you to take a look. Now, leading into our discussion this morning, there are two bits of insight I'd want to share before then offering some reflections for us to consider together. The first is a survey that we ran at UK level earlier this year with nearly 700 directors taking part, where it was clear everybody thinks sustainability is important, but you have a complete understanding of how to get there and still most feel the costs are prohibitive. Previous surveys that we'd run had shown many organisations had still not el elevated the accountability for sustainability to director level, but that is definitely changing. And then my second piece of insight comes from a month ago when IOD hosted our global um, COP conference. And at that, delegates shared, yes, you've guessed it, unclear how to start still and unclear as to how they would go about starting to practically manage the transition to a less extractive and more circular resource model. This is despite there being a plethora of guidance, websites, toolkits, etc. and a pretty strong consensus on what some of the basics are, the knowing your numbers, start with basics and make it easy for everyone, invest and support in nature-based solutions, trees, bees, peatland, marine, switch to renewable energy, switch to electric vehicles, and so on. So there is a disconnect, and I'm really thoughtful about that, and I'm really interested in your own experience and views about where this comes from, but crucially, how we can overcome it. Now, in terms of ESG itself, there are certainly people at this event far more expert on this than I am. But it's certainly the case that ESG has now gone mainstream. Regarded as niche until relatively recently, the ESG approach looks beyond traditional financial metrics for investment by including environmental, social and governance factors to assess an organisation's performance. And it is niche no more. It is now a significant shift and it needs to be. The OECD estimates that at least $7 trillion a year globally will be needed to fund the global transition to a low carbon and sustainable economy that is aligned to the Paris Climate Agreement and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So clearly financial institutions have a key role to play in redirecting mainstream funds to promote sustainable growth and improve access to financial services so that we leave no one behind the central tenet of the SDGs. Now, ESG specialist Fran Van Dulk, founding partner of One Stone Advisors, a global B Corp, which helps businesses become more effective sustainability leaders, points out that for the financial and business sectors to thrive in this new low carbon and sustainable economy, senior leaders and boards must learn to navigate strategic mission critical ESG risks and opportunities in energy and supply chains, biodiversity, water scarcity, inequality and human rights. But it seems few boards are equipped to do so, so far. In fact, according to research carried out at New York University Stern Center for Sustainable Business, of 1,200 board members of the Fortune 100 companies studied, only five had relevant climate expertise. And at the same time, carbon emissions commitments by large companies tripled in 2020. So that scale of ambition is impressive, but how much scrutiny were these targets given by company boards and how will they hold the executives accountable for delivering them? 
We've seen from the Paris Agreement that COP commitments drive regulation. And we have the evidence that market confidence grows with ESG transparency. These are powerful drivers and whichever way you look at it, boards need to be taking this very seriously indeed. And Van Dielk also points out in a recent essay that the S of ESG, almost silent up until the COVID pandemic, is rising up the agenda. And for investors in particular, future proofing includes ensuring that your investment strategy goes beyond screening out companies with negative impacts and ensuring that it accounts for the positive changes a different allocation of capital will actually make to people in the future. So basically, this means shifting away from the previous assumptions where the question was, this investment is a going concern, to now investors making value judgments and asking transformational questions about generational stewardship. So within those organisations, leaders must be authentic. Greenwashing doesn't work. Companies cannot continue to just keep doing what they do, but a bit greener. Stakeholders, including large institutional investors, see through those myths and are now increasingly taking action. So radical change is needed, not pretend or half-hearted sustainability. Now, of course, organisations can't expect a sustainability culture to spontaneously appear at board level. It must be proactively nurtured. And there are many businesses who do innovate and contribute hugely to their community and society, and many have sustainable practices. But often these can be ad hoc or not systemic. But this moment, this moment calls for a different order of greater commitment with the whole business refocused around sustainable outcomes. I'd also include public owned assets and organisations here, of course, who have a significant contribution to make. Now, in our conversations at the IOD with directors across Scotland, what comes up often is that boards need reliable, valid data. Comes up all the time. And that directors, especially FDs, need to get started and not wait for perfection, but get the conversation going that generates action. And it really is the case now, the pressure is there to say the ESG measures should be reported as frequently as financial measures. There is no doubt this is difficult stuff, but we can do difficult stuff, right? Using purpose, vision and values as your North Star, it's always going to help any organisation through conflicting priorities and tough times, as well acknowledging compromise, admitting what is as yet undone and failures and trial projects. Because moving forward honestly and transparently will generate shared learning and trust, and we all know the value of those. But let's think about a couple of wider questions, such as considering what your own business and organisation would look like in a truly circular economy, rather than just settling for improvements in our current linear resource thinking. And have you even begun to think about adaptation and resilience in the face of the climate changes which will hit Scotland, irregardless of whether we remain within 1.5 degrees or not? Or how about whether your board has discussed if ecocide should be added to your risk register? Sounds potentially too far on the outfield? Not according to barrister Jojo Mehta of Stop Ecocide International, who makes a compelling case that ecocide, which is defined as the unlawful or wanton acts committed with knowledge that there is a substantial likelihood of severe and widespread or long-term damage to the environment being done, being caused by those acts. There is a case that ecocide should become an international crime. Now, support is growing, and maybe within the next four to five years, it is not inconceivable that directors will be held criminally responsible for ecocide and will no longer be able to stand behind lawful legitimation to justify making profits from projects that knowingly cause real environmental harm. Think of the impact of that. Meta says we need to stop crawling towards better behaviour and start sprinting. 
So urgency, rigorous accountability and creativity is all part of that magic governance mix. And our public business and third sector worlds are so in interconnected that it's increasingly clear that great boards need to be made up of diverse directors with a global citizen mindset, acting as a force for good and taking responsibility to collaborate for a healthier, fairer planet. A strong, sustainable economy goes hand in hand with a fair and equal society. So the time for happy talk is over. The choice is not between cheap inaction and expensive action. Since, yeah, action costs, but inaction costs way more. Symbolic moves don't move the dial. But, there's always a but, isn't there? But is it good enough to be a good company or organisation operating in a bad system? The worldwide problems of poverty, hunger, war are systemic ones and we cannot continue to only focus on relieving the symptoms or finding different ways to admire the problem. We have to raise our gaze. The movement for a well-being economy calls for national economies to deliver for citizens' basic needs without putting undue pressure on the planet or breaching its biophysical limits. And in seeking economic structural system change, we need to think about a well-being economy which is in service of higher goals, delivering social justice on a healthy planet for all. Extreme inequality, the impact of post-colonial systems, and the fragility of the climate in the global south all need to be part of our thinking and our action. Global justice is at the root of true sustainability. And we have to acknowledge that power, politics and models of governance have driven the design of our current systems that aren't working fairly. Momentum around these ideas, as I'm sure you know, is growing. There are seeds of it in Scotland's National Performance Framework, Wales's Future Generations Commissioner, governments such as New Zealand basing their budgets on wellbeing goals and targets. So change is coming, but many are fearful, of course, that for many spheres of our ecosystem, we are out of time. So systems thinking is vital, but again, it doesn't happen by default. It takes deliberate design and committed ethical leadership from those in power and those who have agency. And on that point of agency, let me set out some final reflections. Van Dielk also makes the case that boards need to combine the experience of baby boomers and Gen Xers with contemporary perspective. She says big intergeneral evolution is happening. A generation is coming up that will think about things very differently? And how will boards capture the perspective of their ultimate beneficiaries if they don't have the diversity of that perspective around the table? At our previously mentioned IOD conference, we explored the themes of leadership, accountability, and acceleration in relation to the climate crisis and the role of the boardroom. And at that event, we invited the 2050 young climate leaders to offer challenge and reflection to each of the sessions from our speakers. It utterly transformed the conversation. Kate Chambers, board trustee of the 2050 Climate Group, highlighted the great ecological instability that humans have created and how this had been compounded by the ongoing culture of consumerism, filling our land with waste in our seas, with plastics and toxic chemicals. But then she spoke so powerfully about how those with the least power and the least agency, young people and the marginalized, are the ones expected to resolve a crisis not of their own making. She rightly asked, how dare we? And this brings me to my previous life as CEO of the National Youth Information and Citizenship Agency, Young Scott. There wasn't a day not a day when I wasn't reminded by young people of the need for adults to take the climate crisis more seriously, alongside a real sense of bewilderment from them as to why we weren't. 
If you haven't watched the keynote speech from Greta Thunberg at the pre-COP Youth Summit in Milan last week, I'd urge you to do so, and I'll maybe attempt to post the link in the chat later or on social media. In that speech, Greta reeled off a list of some of the most common phrases used by leaders across the world when talking about their response to the climate crisis. Climate change is an opportunity. We can achieve a win-win between conservation and development. We need to walk the talk. Green jobs. And then she started adding in a chant, blah, blah, blah. There is no planet B, blah, blah, blah. Smooth transition, blah, blah, blah. It was a long list and it went on for an uncomfortably long time. And it was shocking and it was powerful and it was the right thing to do, I reckon. Right, because it makes us all question whether we are seeking refuge in the old ways rather than resolving to create the real systemic change which is necessary. It brings to mind the John Maynard Keynes quote, the difficulty lies not so much in developing new ideas as in escaping from old ones. Young climate activists are clear that we cannot survive another call to arms or recalibration of targets. The time for warm words and commitments is done, and it's now about rapid acceleration to implementation with a boldness and a unity we haven't seen before. We have to move at the speed of the most urgent need. There, the will is there, but what is needed to underpin and catalyze that acceleration? IOD Scotland believes that we are all sustainability directors now each one of us responsible for shifting our mindset for our organisations. So to stop aspiring to be the best in the world to being the best for the world. Glasgow in 24 days time must be a stepping stone to an era of implementation. The start of what is being called this decisive decade for humanity COP26 is the springboard to move from ambition to implementation and ESG alongside other frameworks is simply part of the toolkit for boards that will help deliver it. It's not a magic bullet but potentially a fulcrum to leverage change faster. So let me leave you with this final thought. Are you convinced that in every aspect of your work, your own work, the work you have control and influence and power over that you personally are responding like the climate crisis is an emergency. Perhaps it is time for us all to ask ourselves the question, are we team implementation or team blah, blah, blah? And I know which one an optimist would choose. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louise. That's um, lots, certainly lots to unpack there. And if anyone's got any questions for Louise, please just add them to the chat. Um, I'll kick off. Um, do you do you think directors generally understand climate risk yet? And is there fear in our boardrooms? I think I think there are some. I think, and I think the numbers are growing. Um, but I think we're probably in a position where there are still many who have seen it as someone else's role. Um, so as I, as I mentioned earlier, you know, a few years ago, you wouldn't have seen sustainability being a portfolio or direct, you know, responsibility around the boardroom table, unless it was a specialist, um, specialist um, company or organisation. Mm -hmm. um, it would be very much something that was you know, part of the, you know, not may even not be the executive team, actually, it might not even have reached there. Whereas I think now increasingly, um, it is starting to kind of move more into the into the boardroom and people recognising that responsibility. I think what's, um, I mean, the fear question is an interesting one. It was interesting in terms of Sam's, uh, Sam Gardner's quote that you mentioned earlier, um, Martin, about fear being a terrible motivator. But, but I think for the boardroom, I, want, I wonder, and again, I'm interested in comments and so on on this, um, 
I wonder if it's less about um, a kind of a will, but more more about not knowing what questions to answer, which is what then loops around, you know, from a board, you know, a great board director, it's about what are the questions you ask, right? It's, it's the, what's the, what's the information you're asking for? What's the questions um, that you're asking? And I do, I do wonder if that's the kind of the space where, because perhaps people don't, you know, they can't get hold of metrics in a way that really makes sense to them or they don't trust um, metrics or they, they're not sure which is the right set of metrics for them, that they're then not quite sure um, which questions to ask. So so for, for us at IOD, I think that's why we're particularly keen to, to ensure that we're bringing, you know, the issue about the knowledge and skills and the information base that's around the boardroom table into this um, conversation um, much, much more, I think, because it's um, we know the impact a great board can have in transforming um, an organisation all the way, you know, all the way through to supply chains and into the community and beyond. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I, I think it's changing. Um, but um, I'm just not sure it's changing at the pace that, that, that the planet needs it to. Okay. And on one interpretation, ESG is, I suppose, just a consideration for the longevity of the business's operating model. Uh, so it's just looking further into the future. So is, is ESG just good corporate governance? And has there been a, potentially a lack of that in some of our businesses in, in the past? Mm, I think it's uh, the what what I'm quite kind of thoughtful about in terms of the ESG conversation and other conversations that I've been in. Bear in mind, it's been four months, Martin. So, <laughs> no, <laughs> so, it's, uh, <laughs> so the conversations that I've been in, um, what's been quite kind of interesting has been around um, you know the conversations about what are the kind of the levers that kind of create change. Where do you need to put your attention? What do you have to pay attention to? You know. Measuring what you measuring what matters, all of these this this will all be common common conversations to those that are part of this kind of discussion. And 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 at the same time, there's this kind of piece about we don't have the tools, we don't have the tools, right? So there's this conversation that says we we just don't and so I think you know, people are then saying things like ESG because it's got form <laughs> um, and because it's it's something that people can get their heads around and can and can understand. I think that's really kind of helpful and 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 also I think because more and more people are paying attention to it now, it suddenly feels like ah, oh, it's that. It's like when things emerge, isn't it? It's like which one kind of survives and which one doesn't. Um, but also, I think there is no doubt that um, you know the impact of the investment community in terms of of you know helping to kind of drive decisions. You know whether you know whether that's angel investors or or or, or kind of you know more corporates that um, the role there in terms of saying to companies, no, this this stuff matters. We think this stuff matters now, so we think that. Um, you know, we're we're probably not going to invest if we can't be sure or we can't get a handle on what you're doing. And and so there are various drivers in play. I think there's very very practical ones around just you know give me a toolkit, um, you know give me the tools to actually kind of do this. And um, which is the thing I hear more than anything else. That's that's the yeah. conversation that dominates. Um, and then and then the kind of these bigger kind of if you like these kind of forces within. Um, investment uh, community as yeah. well um, to, to drive that change. And, and just, just on that investment point, we've got a question from Angus uh, who's asking, uh, well, he, he says here, I, I'm concerned that the more conservative members of the influential investment community are highly sceptical about ESG as they see it as another yoke to stifle innovation. Uh, what, what do you think we can do to get these people on side? Oh, it's a good one, um, and it's it's under you know I, I understand the question. I understand where that that would um, kind of come from. Um, I suppose the there are other as other elements shift, right? So as society kind of shifts, there will come a point where actually some of those investors might end up becoming the outliers. I would say that actually if they're if they're not they need you know, that that paying attention to those societal shifts, paying attention to also regulation. I mentioned it in the um in my opening kind of remarks that um, you know, 
you know, cops drive, you know, more regulation comes from cops, you know, um, and there will be then more from governments and, um, and so on. And so the, um, the operating environment um, and the way that you can kind of do good business or good work will change. And so the, you know, that scepticism or, or, and cynicism ar around those things um, is understandable, but actually there has to be a moment that says, well, well, who do, who do we need to bring into the room to have a conversation about about this and to and to kind of reach a point where we we all understand? Okay, what are the concerns? What's the you know what's the kind of the, the you know is there a, a fear around this or is it simply a nervousness that it's just a, a, another emperor's new clothes and we'll have to worry about something else in six months' time? So I think for me it's about kind of dialogue and conversation. Um, it is said that um, cynicism is the last refuge of the hopeful. So um, maybe there is still a, a, a kind of a tiny piece of hope for in there as well. Yeah, I hope so. Um, you, were, you were talking there about toolkits and, um, you know, I, I, in my experience, in its recent history, ESG has been characterised by this clamour for externally imposed standards and toolkits and accreditations. Um, do you think there's an over reliance on that at the moment? Is responsibility being outsourced? Um, are we being you know blinded by these these accreditations and standards? Mm. It's a yeah, it's a it's a good question, isn't it? About how much you you know outsource slash collaboration. I suppose it's how you do your outsourcing really, and how collaborative you are in your approach to that as well. But and how you set that up in terms of how you then bring learning back into the organisation, but. But there's no doubt, I mean, these these things, um, these kind of toolkits and so on can be real drivers, you know, for organisations. Look at investors and people, if you like, or healthy work and lives toolkits or toolkits around equality and inclusion or, you know, these kind of things that, that often these... Um, these methodologies can help kind of drive um, internal change, um, sometimes a bit more effectively. The trick absolutely then is about how you then kind of embed that learning and keep that culture going and don't make it the sort of stuff that then continue to relies on and um, bringing people in. But then that's great leadership. You know, that's about, you know, a great leadership and a great board will be, will be a, alive to that fact and we'll be saying, OK, we might need to do this and get to get us to this level, recognising this is where we need to get to. Let's use that. But then how do we then make sure we embed that, we keep that going as a, as a culture within the organisation? And I don't know if you've read um, Professor Mariana Matsukato's new book, The Moonshot Guide to Capitalism. Great. It's worth a, worth a read if you haven't. But she um, likens um, the kind of the climate crisis to the, um, the, the um, efforts it took to, to get the first person on the moon. Um, and the years leading up to it in the space race and so on. And, um, and what she's talking about is the fact that that required public and private um, collaboration. So government and business and industry, science, engineering, the works, all working together. But her concern is that quite often when that happens, that that expertise isn't then brought in. You know, the government or the public body doesn't learn or... You know, because actually they've said you do the innovation and we'll just do this, but over here. So there's there's a there's a parallel there for me as well. And where that comes together is in um, is in thinking about your kind of leadership practice. And and maybe that's why maybe leaders don't need to um, be quite so fearful about um, in terms of taking steps towards kind of sustainability and so on. Because actually, this is less about you know. Your, your absolute technical knowledge of, you know, the proponents of concrete or whatever and whatever that might be in terms of um, carbon and whatever, but actually it's more about, as a leader, how do we get the best out of this organisation? How do we transform the organisation to be able to do these things, to take that approach and so on? So that's why it's... Um, I don't think ESG is unique in that regard. I think organisations do this take this kind of approach a lot, I think the um, the warning flag for me would be about not then embedding that into culture and practice. Okay. Um, during during the sort of COVID period, um, I think the general consensus was there was a greater spirit of collaboration um, 
by businesses and the response to COVID-19. Do you see that collaboration extending to the climate emergency? And do you have any thoughts on whether or not net zero is better delivered by competition or collaboration? Oh, that's an interesting one. Can you have both? <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, maybe take both, Martin. I think, mm. so yeah, I think there's 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 no doubt. I mean, just, you know, we, there are so many incredible stories of um, businesses and organisations, purpose-led businesses and organisations, you know, just, just doing incredible, doing what needed to be done over the past kind of 18 months in terms of, um, in particular, um, SMEs and the support that they gave in their communities and, um, and so on. I think it was really... Um, um, extraordinary to see some of those those efforts and we're hearing still you know hearing stories about that the IOD from our, our members about what people have done very quietly quite often in their communities um, but I think that 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 sense of um, how how can we just kind of get this done that that sense of urgency that the sense of responding to, to kind of need um, is something that um, we absolutely need to kind of bring into to this space. I mean, I was, you know, I attended the, um, you know, the Climate Resilience Summit um, last week, the Scottish Climate Resilience Summit, and some of the stuff around adaptation and resilience is really pretty grim. And I'm not sure that we've recognised what the impact is going to be on Scotland, never mind anywhere else. And so for me, it's about that kind of sense of urgency um, but the innovation piece is definitely there. You know, there's great examples of um, of companies, in particular, smaller companies working also with their supply chains. Um, so really thinking about, well, actually, in terms of our supply chains, what are the options around that being kind of circular or what are the interventions we can make, you know, across the kind of the process that we could collaborate on and work together that actually helps us both you know, and I'm in danger of blah, blah, blah territory here, Martin, I know, but, you know, but actually, you know, it does actually work for, for both um, organisations. Yeah. Um, so there's, um, you know, and, and that that teaming up, you know, whether it is, you know, the use of, of, of kind of waste from one, you know, manufacturing um, cycle being then being used by another company for production or, you know, whatever that might be. Um, but even things like, you know, um, and I'll, I'll not get this completely right, but um, there was even something quite interesting for, that I heard about the other day, which was like a really small company that was, you know, was was doing huge amounts in terms of um, kind of deliveries and so on and lots of pallets and, um, and so on. But actually, they, they kind of suddenly just stopped themselves and went, why are we doing it that way when actually we know an organisation not that far away who kind of needs this stuff and can... Yeah. And it was just a moment, it was just a moment where somebody, somebody asked the question, you know, why, why are we doing that? What, you know, and, and what can we do instead? Um, so I think there are, I think, but it needs to be, uh, um, as ever with these things, the ecosystem needs to be an enabling one. Um, we need to stop people being beaten over the head as well if they, yeah. you know, if, if they do pop their head above the parapet, I would, I would say that is something I've also noticed over the past uh, period when I've been in, is that there is there is a fear among some organisations of talking about what they're doing or sharing what they're doing in terms of going towards net zero. Because either, if they talk about it, they'll either get, you're not doing enough or you're not doing it fast enough, or they'll get, but you're, on, you're, you're you know, look at your history or look at whatever, how can you possibly, yeah. you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, and actually, there's some great stuff happening in those spaces. But the problem with them feeling that they can't share it means that we don't learn. <laughs> you know, and it kind of, you know, others don't learn from it or we're not in a kind of a shared learning cycle. So there's a, there's a wee bit for me about just thinking about how do we kind of create that space for collaborative kind of conversations to happen. But yeah. there's no doubt, you know, there's great stuff kind of going on. Fuel change and is a great example of how they're involving young modern apprentices and these sorts of things while they're also doing their apprenticeships and manufacturing and so on. So there's some great projects as well. And Napier will know lots too. They could real Napier team could reel off a list longer than I ever could. Yeah, and it's uh, you know it's, it's interesting thinking about um, businesses where you can which are altruistic but are still reaping the rewards from it. So and, and positioning themselves as a leader in the minds of consumers uh, at, at while they do it. And 
you know, the classic example is Volvo inventing the, the, the sort of you know, the seatbelt as we know it. And rather than patenting that and keeping it to themselves, they made it freely available. And now in everyone's minds, Volvo is synonymous with safety. Um, so, you know, there's, there's certainly, uh, you know, examples there um, where businesses can do the right thing and actually gain a competitive advantage from it. Yeah, um, for sure. It just, I'm just wondering, I, I, again, I, I know this is a, a, something you're interested in. Um, is the need for a just transition on the agenda of our boards? Is, is that something that, 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 that they care about? Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't want to, you know, I think there's a, there's a danger sometimes with these of presenting kind of binaries of, you know, corporate yeah. boards and all of these. And you have to remember, these boards are made up of people. It's humans. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, humans with families and, you know, and pet dogs, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I think there's a, um, so I think, you know, thinking about our kind of language and our mindset in thinking about these spaces as well, it's really um, important to... To, to kind of reach beyond that kind of, if you like, corporate facade and and think about the, the people that are, are there. And I think, you know, really, you know, powerful conversations about um, what we are kind of seeing in terms of inequality and poverty are, are not ones that, that can be swept to one side. You know, I think that, um, and so actually having those conversations and, 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 recognizing the situation that so many and these might you know these are these are people in the communities that these organizations serve these are customers these are people who are part of you know working in the, you know part of their supply chains or whatever and um, that actually <laughs> the, the the bit about it kind of going hand in hand takes me into that blah 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 territory Greta's made me nervous which is great I love it because <laughs> it keeps you on your toes um, which is what young people will always do, <laughs> but there's, but but genuinely, we cannot get a thriving economy if we don't have that kind of you know fair and equitable you know world because they they will lift each other if that makes sense you know they are completely interconnected and and you can't really have one without the other you know it will unbalance and so. Um, and so I think that there's a there's a place for moving beyond the kind of traditional um, business civic rhetoric um, and actually going into kind of quite um, um, kind of deeper conversations. And there are lots who are are having those conversations. You know, I mentioned Douglas Lamont, you know, um, of Innocent Drinks, um, but equally, um, you know, people like Archie Miko from um, Ashwood and, and Construction and the work that he's doing in particular about how he supports um, um, community through training um, and fair work, um, and, you know, so committed to kind of fair work principles. Um, and, and because, you know, it's it's the right thing to do, but it makes kind of business sense. And, and I think that if we can start to broker more conversations, but equally also kind of really kind of demonstrate where this is working, you know, and and again, I'd loop back to um, the role of the board in that. Um, you know, the boardroom is where, you know, a, a great chair and great non-execs will, will be actually bringing this to the table and saying, or the virtual room <laughs> as it is now, um, you know, we'll be, we'll be bringing that in and, and saying, you know what is the impact this is having on us as a company but but actually what's the difference that we could make knowing that you know i talked about trust earlier you know and trust and loyalty you know those things are incredibly powerful so how do we how do we kind of build that so the role of the the um the director and being quite kind of um bold and thoughtful and bringing those conversations to the table is important but i'd be i suppose i'd just remain a bit cautious about you know, binary set setups in terms of sure. um, these kind of conversations. Yeah, no, absolutely. Every every board is, is different in its in its own way. Um, but in the, I suppose, in the popular imagination, the company boardroom is where you know older, mainly male uh, directors meet a few times a year to, to essentially rubber stamp what the CEO wants. And you talked a little bit about um, diversity in the boardroom. Um, you know. Would would a greater you know a focus on a large and diverse boards 
um, give both you know a, a greater focus on ESG and just better corporate governance. Yeah, without question, without question. And you know, I'd add to your list um, that you know that most um, boards are also pretty shockingly white. Um, and so the kind of the um, representation from black and people of colour um, on boards is, um, is is incredibly poor. Um, so yes, I mean I think I think the you know the conversations and the evidence around diversity and the, the importance of diversity of the board are, are are easily easily found. You can go to you know a, you know a million um, surveys and at your fingertips really that have showed this in terms of the impact that it then has. You know the old um, again a blah 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 the triple bottom line, but you know but the impact it has on these things and having having that and that that sense of bringing different perspectives, different life experience, um, different lived experience um, and different kind of questioning, um, bringing a kind of a, a lens that, um, uh, that that allows people to kind of see things, see different perspectives and challenge. Um, I think it makes us all better, doesn't it? You know, when you're involved in a kind of a debate, you know, mutual respect and but respectful challenge, um, you know, is, is a great thing you know great dialogue you know and and better ideas are always welcome you know so i think that um you know that openness to diversity on a board is is incredibly um, vital and and for me of course you knew i was going to say this but that involves young people and um, having young people on the board in particular i think i think there's an interesting dimension around having young people on on a board in relation to sustainability because it's 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 genuinely not a like sustainability is not an option. It's like well, no, we have to do it. Like it's not. Do you see what I mean? It's like you know, young people can arrive with a no. This is what we have to do. Why are you not doing this? Um, and and I and that is again, you know, intergenerationally really powerful. That's a really powerful collaboration. Again, you can tell my fear of. Um, separation, um, but bringing those that together, and you know, in terms of boards and so on, there's lots of organisations now who have young people on their boards, and I actually mean young people. I don't mean with the best of intentions. I don't mean those aged forty. Um, yeah, you know, young boards. Scott, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So young Scott, our vice chair, was sixteen when she was appointed um, yeah. and, there, and there are many other organisations there's now a great young trustee movement of course led out of Napier in fact um, Miles Weaver does huge work at Napier around young trustees mm -hmm. just doing brilliant work um, so um, so yeah I uh, think a kind of conversation yeah. with him around that is hugely important. And, and there's, some, there's some really interesting ideas in law actually at the moment around intergenerational equity and, and you know, yes. essentially the human rights of future generations um, and that, that leads us on to another question we have, which does refer back to your, your previous role. Uh, and the question is, what advice would you give a young person just setting out in the world of work that wants to make a real difference in environmental salvation and social improvement? Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, I can't remember um, who said it, but there's a great kind of uh, philosophy quote, which is um, where... Um, your passion um, meets the hunger of the world is the place to be. So whatever it is you're passionate about, um, then find find where there is a need in relation to that passion and go there. So, and, and we say, you know, and young people are under so much pressure to make decisions and about their jobs. And we could hold a whole other conversation about what the purpose of education is in terms of, is it about creating economic widgets or, in my view, fulfilled um, human beings. Um, but, um, but actually, um, I think what works out best is, is follow your passion. So whatever you're passionate about, um, go there and know that there are lots of people who would want to help you as well, because in particular, cross sectors, business, you know, third civic sec um, society, there's always going to be people who will want to help. So um, reach out and, uh, and, and get some uh, help from those that are there to support you as well. OK, um, we're almost out of time, uh, Louise, so I'm going to ask you one more question which you're going to have to answer in probably less than five seconds, but it's going to be, it's going to be a difficult one. Um, so your, your background is as an advocate for 
your members at Young Scott, you've stated you want to ensure that the voices of Scottish business leaders are heard. What do Scottish people, or what do Scottish business people want from government? Um, I think that business um, from government wants a um, wants a constructive um, and collaborative um, partnership. Um, and I am confident that that is something that the collective business leadership organisations and the Scottish Government can, can do because great dialogue is um, an understanding of each other's perspectives is, uh, is what helps to create change. Thank you. Thanks very much, Louise. Thank you.